there we go. So recordings in progress, right? So um, the whole point of this really is to kind of give an oversight on kind of ultra marathons, what they are, what they aren't. And then I'm going to break it down into two parts. So part one is basically taking somebody who's done a bit of running, maybe run up to kind of the odd 10K half marathon or even less than that, does a lot of hiking perhaps and is considering an ultra marathon. So I think it's important for, if you're new to this to define what an ultra marathon is. The literal definition is any distance over 42.2 kilometers, which is a marathon distance. It's literally the definition of it. However, because there doesn't like, you know, if you were to run 42 and a half kilometers, would you feel like that's an ultra? Would you feel like it's different? The more widely accepted kind of definition. And if you look at most of the events, will either say if it was that distance, it would say it was a trail marathon ish. Or if it was an ultra, they would usually say it's around 50 kilometers. And most ultras as well, although not always the case, most ultras are run on kind of countryside terrain, maybe some path mixed in there. My, maybe it's on a canal towpath, park, whatever. So the terrain in which these are run aren't your typical road marathon type terrains. So that's really the first point of difference. So I've worked with people before who've got a good running base and a good running background. And that certainly is a massive advantage in terms of, you know, well, being able to run for long distances if you run a half marathon or a marathon before is a big advantage in terms of having the over, overall aerobic engine, the, the, the ability to kind of do a task for a long period of time. You'll have probably learned some stuff about nutrition and hydration if you've done those sorts of things. Uh, or if anything, how much it can suck to cover those kind of differences over the period of a day or half a day. So I think there is an advantage to that, but it's not the same thing. I've worked with people before who've come from road running and there are, there are very distinct differences. So the first part of what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit about the distinct differences between sort of trail running and a trail marathon. You might go, if you've run a marathon before, it's only 8K further. It's not, it's a different gravy. A little anecdote to kind of highlight that is um, at, actually at the end of the Race to the Stones, a guy came up to me and we were just chatting at the end whilst I was waiting for everyone else to arrive. Um, and the guy was like, he'd done in a full Ironman before and said it was a harder event. So bearing in mind, a full Ironman has a marathon at the end of a, uh, at the end of a 180 kilometer bike ride and a 3.8 kilometer swim. And he said that that was tougher and he was trying to ask me why it felt tougher. So the reasons it feels tougher is, is, is simple and complex in equal measure. Um, one, it's the fact that we, I think a lot of people have an expectation around ultra running, which is that, well, if I can run a sub four hour marathon, Therefore, 50K will take me around about five hours. And it become, people get their pacing wrong because as soon as you start throwing in what I call the G and Ts, which is the gain in the terrain, as soon as you look, start looking at the elevation gain and losses, and we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail, that's where people really start to get themselves in a bit of bother if they're not used to it. Because running off pace on your watch becomes completely meaningless outside of the terrain that you normally run on, being flat or on a treadmill. I've got all the time in the world for road running, all the time in the world for doing sessions on treadmills. In fact, I'll show you some of the programs that I've built, and a lot of them can be done on those things. But the first thing that I would, if you were looking at doing something next year, would be to think about this idea of gain and terrain. So I'm going to share a screen with you now because I'll end up just talking through all of this stuff, and I put effort into making a PowerPoint presentation. So you know what? I'm going to damn well share it, right? That's what's going to happen. Um, okay, so hopefully you'll be able to see the screen. Right, I'll just leave it on that for now. I'll we'll scroll through. So um, just a quick question, Blake, because I can see you. If, if I'm hovering my mouse over the screen, can you see my mouse on the screen there as well, or is it mouseless? Yeah, good. Okay, good. So I know what I'm pointing at, right? Um, I will just pan it for a quick second. So, excuse me. Okay, so um, the the... the Fundamentally, I was trying to think about this from the question that the point of view of the question or the worry that people would have sign up to this, right? And the first thing that most people will, um, you know, people want to think about the training and the nutrition, but fundamentally at the heart of all of this is it's like, am I going to fail? That's what people want to know and how to avoid failure, right? So at first, we can avoid failure. Second, if we can avoid failure and do it and feel pretty fit and in one piece at the end of it. At those, two point, at those two points, which is where the end of the first presentation kind of ends, then we can start worrying about getting fast, okay? Um, I came into trail running very, very blind. So trust me, a lot of this is science, and a lot of this is my experience of being a many failed ultra runner and the silly little things that I've got right. Well, the accidental things I've got right and many of the silly things I've got wrong, combined with just the wider education that's out there that I've combined. So... The three physical re reasons that people are going to fail, right, and this is why you're not going to fail, is their feet, 
their feet and their feet, right? And by that, I'm talking about three kinds of feet. So I'm talking about feet as in your hooves that stick off the end of your legs. I'm talking about feet in terms of the elevation gain, right? So the amount of, uh, the amount of altitude elevation that you're going to gain over the course of a race. And that includes gain in terms of altitude is something to worry about and freak out about. It's not so much the gain, it's the type of gain. So if it's like very steep or it's undulating can have a massive impact in terms of how you run. I don't mind steep stuff going up, going down, it's a pain in the backside. Undulating stuff is where I, where I thrive, okay? That's what I like to do because I can just use my heavy backside to roll down the hills and I seem to be quite good at descending things because I'm strong. We'll talk about those things in a minute. And the third feat is <clears throat> in terms of the time on your feet. So when you're training for your first ultra marathon, I think one of the biggest concerns really is the amount of time that it takes to train. Now, ultra marathons come in different sizes, different shapes, different distances. For the sake of this presentation, I'm going to talk about this from the idea of a 50K event, so a one-day 50K event. Although a lot of the principles still hold true regardless of the, of the duration of the event. So if you wanted to do 50K one day, 50K another, it's just a case of thinking about this plus a percentage extra that you might want to do. So let's go through our three feet, okay? So things that were novel to me, and if you look at the biggest injuries that people occur on ultramarathons and the biggest reasons why people will drop out, particularly for their first one, because if they're not used to having them or used to dealing with them, is blisters, okay? So in order to deal with blisters, we need to get proper appropriate trail socks. So, you know, you can get these in gingy toe socks. You can get, um, I've got Runderwear ones. I've got 100-mile socks. There's different ones, different types. And I found them all as all pretty effective. The one thing that I would say is the most effective, though, is making sure that they're either, um, like dual, you can get, like, dual-layered socks. And you don't want anything that's going to be too irritating to your feet. So with anything, everyone, if you look at any trail running group, people will say, um, oh, you know, this is the best sock. That's the best sock. The chances are you just want to gonna try it, try a few pairs and just see which ones fit best for you. Um, I, I personally, I will always, I try and use the Injinji toe socks, like a thin toe liner sock. And then I will put another sock over the top just because I get really bad blisters. Like anyone who's seen my feet after an ultra will testify to that. So for me, I need to have my toe socks and I need to have a second sock as well, just because then that means that anything that's friction against the side of the shoe is the top sock and that protects my skin. OK, the, the thing that's going to most likely cause people blisters, though, is is their footwear and, and wrong fitting footwear. Um, so, again, people will talk about heel drop sizes. If you're used to running in normal trainers, then don't go to like a zero drop shoe. You can transition to a zero drop shoe. So drop is just the difference between the heel height and where your toes sit. So that would be like an eight millimeter drop. And then a zero drop would be your heel is at the same height as the toe of the shoe. OK, so. If, you, if you're transitioning and running in normal running trainers for most trails, so for example, the race to the stones, you could probably have done that in a decent training shoe with the conditions. It was quite hot. It was quite firm and the terrain isn't too technical. However, the things that when I talk about this idea of terrain, it's two, it's two things. One is the, um, the ups and downs and, and the, the uneven surfacing and the second is you know a lot of the, the ultra runs in this country are on like farmers tracks and things like that so stones puncturing through the bottom of your feet can leave them quite tenderized i think a good training shoe with a decently thick sole will do most people like up to 50k like marathon and above if you're going to do longer than that that's where i think footwear becomes particularly important in terms of um both toe protection so a lot of trail shoes will have like a toe bumper on them because if you go punting rocks it's not a fun day at the office been there seen it done it got the t-shirt and even with good protection it can still hurt considerably so i think that doing a little bit of exploration around the different types of footwear and one of the things that you you might want to do and one of the things you might want to try is making sure that you um you typically the advice would be buying shoe sizes half a size up so you've got a little bit of room at the end of your toe for two reasons one when you're coming downhill your feet are going to slip and the second is that you're going to um the second is that your feet are going to swell when you run a lot of people's feet swell considerably so you don't want the shoe pinch into the outside of the foot and that's going to cause blisters and even if it sucks physically the last thing you need like in terms of you're tired dehydrated energy levels are low mood states low the last thing you need to then be worrying about is blisters run for long enough and it's going to happen right i get horrific blisters if you are prone to blisters and your training will tell you whether you are or not if you're an experienced running you'll probably know then the best thing we can do is eat with prevention 
and then also figuring out strategies in which to deal with blisters. I'm not going to get into blister prevention here as well, um, because that's a whole topic going into itself. So good socks, decent shoes, and then figuring out if you get what are called hot spots in your feet, you'll get very in tune with how your feet are feeling the more distance you cover. You'll start to figure out that like, oh, actually, I get little blisters here or a little showing of a blister there. So in terms of in terms of looking after feet, that's when we want to make sure that like those areas of your feet that you can tape. And then like a lot of uh, ultra athletes as well will use some kind of foot lubrication like squirrels, nut butter. I just use a coconut, like a coconut butter, like a, not a coconut butter that you cook with, like a coconut skin butter. So what you want to do is make sure your feet are well moisturized, well looked after. You want to condition your feet to cover in long distances. So you want a, a combination of kind of like firmness and suppleness. If you don't do a lot of um, a good exercise to try for this. So I do a lot of my strength training barefooted because I can, because it's my gym and I can do what I want. So like I'm used to grabbing the floor with my feet. So my feet are quite strong as well for like, and you'd be surprised at how much your feet are active. Good little exercise to do to strengthen your feet is grab a towel, put the towel on the floor and then try and roll the towel up with your toes. Okay. Just do that for like five or six minutes a day. If you, if, if not, not necessarily every day, but just a few minutes a day, if you feel like, you know, um, particularly for people, if they're used to getting foot pain, plantar fasciitis, things like that, if you do a lot of running, probably a foot strength issue. So we need to strengthen those tendons, those ligaments and those musculature around the feet. And yeah, so that's, that's the biggest issue that most people will have. So even if people decide I'm going to do an ultra, but I'm just going to walk for a day or walk the day, you know, and it might be on your feet for 10 hours that day to say walk a 50k it might be slightly longer to walk it because of the elevation that you you at least want to be keeping on top of what i call your foot admin okay take a couple of spare pairs of socks with you again we'll tie this in with the kit element i always take a couple of spare pairs of socks with me i'll always take talc i'll always take something to dry my feet if i'm doing when i'm doing super long distant ultras if i've got an aid station i've got a support crew i will take my shoes off and i will get my feet cool quickly so i'll put them in a cold water i'll put them on ice i'll get the swelling down i'll get them dry again because you don't want wet feet that's what causes the blisters that and the friction so again the longer you go the more of this you'll have to pay attention to chances are you're still going to get one or two little little bad boys but they're not going to be the worst thing in the world and it's you know it's better having blisters for the last five six seven kilometers than it is having them for the last 40 kilometers right so we might not be able to prevent them entirely but we can at least limit the onset of those things and deal with the severity of them as well okay so feet's the major one. And then the next one really is the second feet is the gain and the elevation gain. This is the one where, well, the gain and the terrain, really. This is the one where people will, if you're going to get injured, this is the reason why, particularly if you're an experienced runner. The subtle little differences, your stride length isn't the same as when you're running on the road. Your gait pattern won't be the same as you're running on the road. You will have to have a slightly different running style if you're running through wooded areas or trail areas because you're going to be picking your feet up. The muscles around your hips are going to get a lot of abuse. Your adductors, your hip flexors are going to get a lot of abuse because you're changing direction constantly. You know, if you're running down a rocky trail, you're constantly shifting from side to side, leaping over puddles if you don't want to get your feet wet. Um, I've had to dodge sheep. Um, one event, we had to take a detour through a field which was like ridiculously deep in grass and mud because there was a, uh, a bull in the field. You know, like all of this stuff can have a massive impact. So... The, the the idea of simply being able to cover the mileage on on a certain amount of terrain is great. One of the mistakes that I made when I first started ultra running was I would do most of my training on a canal towpath because it was nice, it was quick, it was easy, there was no roads, it was convenient, it was on my doorstep. I got really good at running long distances on fairly flat terrain. The second, and even moderately undulating was fine. The first time I did a big event with a lot of um, elevation gain, it was like, wow not just not just the physical aspects of like the energy systems like your fitness is your fitness but just the fatigue in those muscle groups and those potentials for strain and the cramp and everything else as well that came with it so the first thing i would say is in terms of gain and terrain if we're going to try and understand that and that's what my little symbols are here so we've got little socks we've got little shoes we've got skin that was meant to be tape for the feet and blister stuff i couldn't find a little thingy tape so our gain and terrain hopefully we won't be going so high that hot air balloons are but um but the, the thing really is that the if you can get the opportunity to go out onto the course or at least understand the terrain at what you're going to be on, then that's a massive advantage. We have this amazing thing called Google. I don't know if you've heard of it. I don't know if you've heard of Google, Google Maps. It's the, apparently all the kids are using it these days, right? So Google Maps now has got a satellite view on it as well. So you can kind of get a rough estimate of what it is. Go on YouTube, 
if you're doing a specific event, look at race reports, get an idea of what the terrain is going to be like. So it might not be that where you live, it's feasible to get out there and train on that kind of terrain all of the time. But at least if you've got some idea, if it's going to be body, muggy, tracky, roady, sandy, snowy, because these take, events take place all over the world. If it's going to be any one of those things, try and get some grasp of what it's going to be like. And also get onto the, the website, try and find what's called a GPX file which is basically, it's a, a G, it's a GPS file. It's called a GPX file. You can download that onto your maps. Uh, you can download that onto your phone, onto your desktop. You can look at the terrain. It'll give you a nice little delightful elevation profile. So you can have a little look at roughly, you know, what you're going to be facing. And again, it's better, it's better to understand. Well, hang on, there's, a, there's an argument to be made here. I would argue it's better to understand what's going to be going on rather than blindly turn up and just try and bludgeon through it with ignorance unless you've got that kind of mindset type. And some people do and some people will just get through it. But I have no doubt that most people who sign up, unless they do pick up severe blisters or an injury, which what was what we're trying, we're trying to, we're trying our best to avoid and prevent, is that it's, you know, it's those two things that are going to stop people hobbling their way to the to the finish, right? So that's the first thing, which is our little map here, is understand the terrain, understand the elevation, and think about where you can simulate some of that in terms of your training, okay? The second thing really to help with that is strength training. Now, strength training isn't necessarily something that's going to prevent injury directly. I, people say strength training prevents injury. It sort of does, but it's not quite as clear-cut a relationship as many people would say in the endurance world. It will improve your running economy. It will improve your running efficiency. But what it will do is the types of movements that you're doing in strength training will strengthen muscles that you probably a lot quicker than you probably will have done um, you, um, from just conventional running. So for example, hip flexors, if you're doing squats, if you're doing step ups, adductors and abductors, if you're doing those kind of specific gym work, you kind of get in a head start in terms of that strength development so that you, you, those muscles are a little bit more resilient and a bit more robust as well. Um, but again, running on that kind of terrain is going to be is going to be not necessarily even running on that terrain, but just being in that terrain on your feet is going to be tantamount to your success. Strength training is is mostly beneficial, I think. And this is the this is the hidden this is the hidden jack in the box, the surprise that gets everybody. People worry about climbing hills because it's hard work, right? You know, gravity is not our friend, and especially if you're a bigger athlete. Who might be watching this because I know some of the guys who watch this kind of come from a strength sport background or are interested in that who've, who've signed up to watch it on replay. You think that going up bit is going to be difficult. Actually, a lot of stronger guys are better going up the hills because even though they might be a bit heavier, that strength really pays dividends because you know you're basically doing step ups for a few hundred meters if it's a big hill, right? And if you're used to doing step ups, guess what? It's going to be easier and those muscles are going to be stronger. It's the downhills where I think the strength training really comes into its own. And the reason for that is because I'm not going to get into the technicalities of it too much here, but when you're strength training, if you're being really careful on the lowering movement, that type of movement pattern is called as an eccentric loading pattern. Okay. So if we're doing a squat, that bit on the way down is eccentric loading. And if we do some eccentric work on our quads, on our hamstrings, on our glutes, what we find is when we're landing, when we're decelerating going down a hill, there's a hell of a lot of eccentric load on the muscles, right? So, it's that there's always eccentric loading when we run through different parts of our running running cycle or leg cycle, but that load is massively mag is magnified when we're braking. Okay, so if you think about downhill braking, that's where people will get frustrated because you go up a nice big steep hill and you're like, right, I'm going to make up time on the downhill, and then your legs are so tired and fatigued that you're coming down the other side, and all of a sudden your legs don't want to do it. Right, so that's why it's important that even if we can run hills, it's important that we we figure out you know, discretion gets the better of valor. And then the third thing really in terms of the gain in the terrain, which is something that's less of an issue is, is the weather. Uh, sorry, it's more of an issue on this than it would be on a road running is the weather. So for example, if you're going to be out for eight to 10 hours, um, you know, if, so even if you were to walk, a, a, be a fairly reasonable middle of the pack runner, you're realistically going to be out for between five and a half to seven hours, dependent on the type of elevation gain for a typical ultra within the UK. Okay. That would be a rough estimation. So you have to be aware that it's the UK weather. It could be hot. It could be su sunny. It could be, uh, sorry, it could be hot and sunny. It could be rainy. It could be one, one minute. And then it could be thunderstormy the next. So we have to make sure that we've got the right equipment, the right kit, the right clothing um, for all eventualities, especially if it's going to be a longer duration event, because you'd be surprised at how quickly something like hypothermia can set in. If you get caught in a sudden downpour and you're walking 
but you're high up at elevation where it's a bit cooler. You've got wind exposure somewhere. You'd be surprised at how quickly things can get very uncomfortable, okay? So we never, even on a hot summer's day, if you're going to be doing an event which maybe leads into late, late, late to early evening, I mean, not this year because it's been like, you know, 27 degrees in the evening, right? But in other years, um, it's, it's shocking how badly it can hit you. Um, so, for example, um, when I did my, my first ever ultra, there was a, a thunderstorm, a bad thunderstorm at about 9, 10 o'clock at night soaked to the bone and then we actually it was a loop course we got pulled off the course got had to get in the car because the lightning was that horrific um for like a couple of hours but in that time my body had cooled so quickly because it's all it's still putting out heat because it's trying to recover to get homeostasis back from the exertions bear in mind i was about 12 hours into an event at this point honestly my i started shaking and i couldn't work out if it was shock i couldn't work out if it was hypothermia but it wasn't a pleasant experience and if it definitely been warmer it wouldn't have been um yeah, if it had been if it had been out and been running still, it might have been fine, but we just weren't allowed to. So, you know, if you have to stop for whatever reason, medical emergency, you might have a blister you're trying to treat, you stop for five minutes on a hot day, that's fine. If it's but if it gets cold and you're already wet, then um, then yeah. So in terms of equipment, if you're not sure or it's gonna take you a long period of time, in your drop in your bags or your rucksacks that you take with you, I'd always say take like a cag in a bag, um, an emergency thermal blanket, and then also um just something to like a, a like a light base layer change of clothes just in case you need it you know just like you can get like one of those little scrunchy ones i always throw one in my bag a spare t-shirt just in case so the weather is the one where i think that's gonna and that's gonna compound the misery of everything else that's going on so if you've already got blisters you're already tired and fatigued you have your navigation you've got a bit lost because we haven't downloaded our gpx file right or we've got we've we've gone a bit errant and that's the other thing as well as part of your experience learn the route learn the route guys don't just rely on signs being there on the day because i had to slack line a barbed wire fence once about 50 50 kilometers into a race and that wasn't a fun experience to try and get over a barbed wire fence because i'd missed the turning and the irony of that was i'd already run that course before as well and i just got complacent because i thought i knew where i was going and got on the wrong side of a fence we all make mistakes we all learn from them in retrospect that's one of the single dumbest things i've done in my life and I got away with it, didn't hurt myself, but that could have gone very, very, very badly, right? Um, but if we didn't do stupid things, we wouldn't have fun stories to tell, right? But hopefully we try and avoid those as best we can. So again, learn the terrain, down a GPX, GPX file onto your watch. If you've got one, I always keep it on my phone and just have it playing back through my ears if I need, to nav if I need the navigation. Most events, like for example, Race to the Stones that we've just, we've just done, they're kind of fine to navigate. They're not, they're not too horrific, okay? So... This is the big question that I think most people would ask is, is do they have enough time to train for an ultra marathon? What's the expectation? Now, this is a, this is one of those, how long's a piece of string questions and the training demand that you place on yourself will largely be determined by the outcomes or goals that you set yourself at the start. Right? So if you look at, if you know you're a decently fit, middle of the pack to upper pack runner and you say right okay you go on to the i'm going to use race to the stones because it's got a lot of data on there it's easy to find or any race that you're doing you go on there and you say right there's a hundred people entered this race i'm a middle of the pack runner so top 50 so i'm going to try and run this time okay and you know where you're going to sit on that spectrum the amount of time you will have to train will depend on your goals and expectations and your start point it's, it's one of those two things. I'll come back to that on the last couple of slides as well, because I just want to talk through like a thought process if you're not sure where to start at this. But typically speaking, I would say if you want to just get through it and be confident that you will survive, hopefully not have any injuries, and also maybe have an enjoyable day out without any pressure of expectation of running, you know, in the upper half of an event. I'm talking from halfway towards the end, like to the back of the pack here. Second half will be like trying to push towards, you know, getting in the top sort of 25 to 30%. Um, or it might just be that you never get in the top 25 to 30%, but you just want to set PBs and that's, you want to take things more seriously. You know, we are where we are genetically and in terms of lifestyle. So the, the biggest determinants of people's success is going to be the amount of time that they have to train, but also how they use that try and try and effectively and not trying to take jumps in their training in order to skip ahead of the curb. So for example, if you sign up to a 50K ultra marathon in 10 weeks time, and you haven't ran before, then you're better off not worrying about running and better off using your training time to just spend time on your feet. Okay, so I'm not suggesting don't run. What I'm suggesting is that you would be better off instead of going, right, I'm going to run 10K this week, 15K next week, 20K the week after and building up 5K a week over, say, eight weeks to get up to 40K. 
the chances are, um, sorry, one second, people just arriving. The chances are that if you do that, you're going to end up injured. If you're trying to build up too much stuff, too much training volume. So I'll talk about that in part two, a little bit more about some theories around improving our training. So to survive our first one, to not fail is basically what we're doing here. It's like playing like, you know, we're playing for a draw here, but we're one nil up from the first leg. We need to draw the second leg to go through on, on away goals. All right. We're just trying to play not to lose. The main thing to do is to, to take it is to take time to spend the third one, which is like time on your feet. So I would say that starting off, you can start to train for an ultra on three hours training a week, week one, right? So even on a 10 week block, you could start by just saying week one, I'm going to do half an hour of strength training. I'm going to do 30 to 60 minutes of running. Okay. And in the rest of my time, I'm just going to get my, get my, get my clogs on, head out into the countryside and go for a walk for an hour and a half, two hours. Okay. Maybe if I feel like running a little bit of the downhills, I'll run downhills. Okay. If I feel like just jog, run, jog, run, very couch to 5k approach, run a bit, walk a bit, run a bit, walk a bit, feed, drink, stay on top of things. Don't worry about pacing. Don't worry about timing. Don't worry about, you know, whether you're smashing your interval sessions or whatever, all of that stuff can come. The fundamental principle is that you want to be spending as much time as you can just out moving. Okay. So that will do two things. One, it will condition your feet and two, it will build your aerobic base. Right. And by the way, walking for two and a half hours or two hours in the countryside isn't the easiest thing in the world. If the weather's bad, if your feet aren't used to it, if you're, um, if you've got some big bloody hills in there. Right. So just be aware that we don't, we need to take this idea of running an ultra off the table straight away. If it's your first one, because even the best ultra runners, the very, very bestest ones at certain events won't run the whole course. Okay. You'll see that they might, they might power hike what we might call it, but they're not they're unlikely to run the whole course. Okay. So I would say that initially the, t- the key priorities is just finding time to get time on your feet and going out and enjoying nature and being a part of it and, and, you know, testing your equipment out, seeing how your feet respond, run a bit, walk a bit. Don't put any pressure to do any interval sessions, but the running sessions that you do do, that's where then you keep them short and sharp. And we'll talk about different types of training session in a, in a minute and just some general kind of rules of how you might structure that. So time off feet, time walking and, a reasonable aerobic base. Now, if someone is is here and they've run a half marathon before on the road, then right now we can start by saying, okay, we're gonna we're gonna maybe run some of that time on our feet as well. Now, week on week, what you're gonna want to do is add time to that. So a very simplistic way of doing this is say, right, okay, if we were doing a 10 week program, and I'd always advise giving yourself longer, by the way, but it would be much easier to be like, right, on this Saturday, on Saturday number one, let's say that's the time you've got to yourself to go and do your long sessions, your hike, your hike walk or whatever it is you want to call it. Um, you're going to go out there and the whole time you're going to be at what we call an effort level of five out of 10. So you should be able to walk and talk, should be able to have a conversation, should be able to cruise and chat. Okay. We're not out there running hard because that's when we're going to get injured if we're not used to that volume. If you're already a, de- a decently experienced runner, then obviously how you break up that time each week is going to be, is going to depend on your level of experience. Now, what I would say is in terms of progression, I'll talk about progression in a little minute, progress your training. It's just time, time and those longer duration activities is going to be more important. So if you hike two hours, week one, three hours, week two, four hours, week three, you're not going to cover loads more distance. If it's in rocky terrain, you'll cover you know, an extra four or 5k dependent on the terrain. They'll give you two things though. One, it'll give you an expectation of how slow you're actually going to be because that was the most shocking thing to me when I first started running on different terrain was my expectation versus reality was way skewed in terms of pacing. Um, at least initially, it calibrates after a period of time and and basically just building up the amount of time that you're spending out there. And if you've got, like I said, if you've got some bits that you want to run and don't want to run, then that's also cool as well, depending on your levels. But you don't need to be training like, eight to 10 hours every single week, right? In fact, in fact, you know, if you only the top, top level ultra runners who run professionally, who are built like, you know, stripped down racing snakes and like they've got the agility and balance of a goat, they'll be doing hundred mile weeks at their peak of their training, right? But, you know, that's equivalent of running four marathons in the course of a week. Let's face it, for most of us, that's just not feasible and certainly not on the ballpark of relevance when we're talking about beginners. So one of the things that we need to do and one of the things that I would encourage people to do, which is why I kind of strip everything back is and one of the frustrations I've had with when I look at coaching programs that are given to ultra runners that are just downloadable PDF type stuff 
is that it tends to make the assumption that everyone needs to train like a professional athlete to survive these things. And actually what happens is, you know, even silly rules like increase your volume by 10% or your distance by 10% or stuff you might have heard from marathon running goes out the window because you're not running on a road. Your pacing strategy, all of that stuff just goes out of the window. So I'm not suggesting that we can't use pace. I'm not suggesting that we can't use distance. But when you're talking about elevation gain, when you're talking about running in the mud and the wind and the rain on boggy trails, it's like you go run the same bit of trail, a canal towpath, a muddy canal, a, dry, a grassy canal towpath in the middle of summer, in the middle of winter, and tell me you can run the same pace, right? Or on a hot day versus a cold day or no shade. And that's, I know that's on the road as well. So we have to get used to running off feel, right? So when we're doing our longer runs, our longer hikes, just a five or six out of 10, nice and easy. Now, as duration increases, there's no such thing as an easy run in an ultra, in an ultra event. There's no such thing as an easy ultra because being on your feet for 50K, whether you're doing it in five hours or 10 hours is, is not, it's not, it's not easy, right? You're just going to get tired. <clears throat> so I think, I don't think people need to be training like 10, 12, 14, 16 hours a week to complete one. I think there's got to be an appreciation that of a weekend, there's probably going to be a chunk of a morning or whatever day it is that you have off or a day where you have spare time, but you're going to need to get out on your feet for probably two hours, probably three hours, probably building up to going out for hikes, hike runs of five to six hours. If you are serious about doing this and coming away from it without feeling like someone's just taking your soul. Right. Yeah. Like, I know people like most people who are moderately fit, you know, could run a 10 K could do whatever could hike through and get through an ultra marathon, but it's not going to be a fun experience for them. So I want this to be as pleasant as possible. And then here's the caveat on that. The fitter you get and the better your training becomes they get more horrible because you know how hard you can push yourself. So they never get any easier, but because you, yeah, well, unless you want to take it easy, but then again, you know, who wants to do that? Where's the fun in that? Right. So I think that to build up to a 50 K distance, you know, if you can find weeks, like the last couple of weeks before you start to kind of cruise into the event, you're probably going to have weekends, weeks where you're going to be doing eight, eight hours training. Like, and by training, I don't mean, by training, I don't necessarily mean like running for eight hours a week. I mean, you know, 30 to 60 minutes of strength training, a little bit of mobility and core work, you know, maybe an hour to two hours of strength training. Then maybe 30 to 60 minutes of other running just to keep yourself, keep, and we'll talk about different types of running in a second. And then the rest of the time then is your kind of long, easy time on your feet, out in the countryside, getting your kit sorted, checking your feet out and all of that kind of stuff, right? So that's all the physical stuff taken care of in terms of like the physiology aspects of stuff, stuff that's going to stop us breaking basically is how I would look at that. Um, the bottom part of that there as well is the, is the three other components which are really easy to get right or wrong. Um, so the first one is just on mindset. Okay, now mindset, people might, have had horrible experiences training for marathons before quite often it's because they've taken the wrong approach of not doing the training, which means the whole thing's a terrible experience and they hate it. Right. Or we're running with injuries or whatever it is that it might be causing us to just feel discomfort. Your mind is exactly the same as your body in terms of, of, of ability to adapt to strain and stress. So that's why we, if we increase our mileage week on week on week and we're, we're take or our time in our feet week on week on week, our brain just gets used to that, that level of stress as well, and it becomes less stressful, okay? So we don't just have fortitude. You get some people who are incredibly mentally tough and resilient, and that's fine. People have got all kinds of resources they pull on mentally in their life. Maybe they're doing their run for a loved one. Maybe it's to show someone wrong. Maybe they're just like a Goggins who hates themselves and translates that out into some kind of anger at the earth and tries to run it. You know, people use different types of motivation to get through these things. But it doesn't have to be this hardcore gogging. If you don't know if you're David Goggins is, it doesn't have to be that way. Resilience can be built over time. Fortitude can be built over time by exposure to the stimulus and knowing that it's just another hour. It's just another half an hour. To the detriment at which this is where it becomes problematic. You get to the point where you're so used to being in that state of discomfort once you're doing really long distance ultras that the threshold between being tough and resilient and stupidity is a, is a fine line. It's difficult to acknowledge. And, and like that's when people get really hurt and injured. I, you know, I ended up with a stress fracture because I thought I had a bit of an ankle issue and it turns out I had a stress fracture. And, you know, then I learned from that and you have to reflect and say, okay, where's the threshold for me DNF in because I'm weak minded and I could keep going. DNF did not finish versus am I actually hurt? 
and most of those things were could have been avoidable by training or just good strategy tactics and a bit of luck because you know you can fall you can trip you can hurt yourself it's all part of the fun of the fair right so resilience is something fortitude is something that can be built the other thing that you will get good at um or will develop is to not panic when things don't go right so whether the weather conditions are there you miss an aid station your navigation goes wrong um you get a hole in your shoe you get a blister your ability to problem solve is probably going to be the thing that gets you through this event not your training right your training will take care of itself if you to make the time commitments to it no that's not easy to do it's when things go wrong so i'm a big the reason i wrote this as why i am going to fail right as a start with the brackets as a not is because i don't have an issue if i think about failure then i can think of all the things and the eventualities that might make me fail right so if i can think of the things that are going to make me fail then i can then think okay well what can i do to prevent those things that call me fail right so it's negative visualization is something i'm a massive fan of with athletes because it allows us to with the athletes i work with privately it, acts, it allows us to prepare for every eventuality so this mental toolkit and this resilience when we're tired we're fatigued whatever's happening we know the resources that are going to be there, right? Now, things will always come up that are unsuspecting. Like you can't know every aspect of a course. You can't know, you know, what's going to happen on any given day. But you will, the one thing that people will, I was, if you can't know, then how do you prepare for it? Well, you prepare for it by checking every eventuality. So if something freakish does happen, that you've got the emotional energy to deal with the thing that's the real stressor, not a million and one things that you haven't thought about, which is why the planning and preparation thing is really important. Because then when something does go wrong, it means that you've got one less thing to really to deal with rather than just this amounting like death by a million paper cuts of being out in the wilderness for 10 hours and something going wrong. So the other thing as well is that if you expect things to go wrong and they do go wrong, if they don't go wrong, great. But if they do go wrong, we're less panicked because our little universe, our little perfect ultra running universe isn't completely disgruntled and goes to dismay. You know, there's not, there's not a single race that I've had where something hasn't just been the way that I thought it was going to be. You know, like you've got to, you go to, you, you assume the aid station, the stock with the foods that you'd like, you get there and there's nothing that you really want to eat or you, you take a gel and you forget that because you're tired and you're running and you're not paying attention. You get given a, you've got any gels, yeah, you get a gel, you neck it. And it turns out that one's the one that upsets your stomach because it's got a sweetener in it you don't like, right? So, you know, you get used to pooping in the wilderness. It happens. Um, all of that kind of stuff is the sort of dark side of trail running, which just becomes normal to you when you just go through the problem, the, the uh, you go through it enough times. So problem solving is a massive skill that can be developed. And that's what something else that you should be thinking about in your training. In those environments, well, what would I do if something went wrong here? How would I get out of this, right? You know, and not to, not to catastrophize it. I'm not trying to put people off. I'm just saying that if we can problem solve and we know we're good at that and we've got everything ticked, then we're, we're fine. Food is an ob food is the next one. Um, figure out what foods you like. Try different foods. Get used to eating whole foods. Initially, I would say like, yeah, your sports gels, your carb drinks, all of that stuff are really useful. But be aware of what foods your digestive system is getting and just get used to eating frequently on your runs. Get used or walks. Get used to taking on nibbles of foods every 20, uh, 30 to 60 minutes. Even if you don't feel like eating, eat just a little nibble, chew on it, get it to, you know, like break down the carbs or whatever it is. Try fats, try carbohydrates, try chocolate, try pretzels, try different vari variations of foods. Just try and get calories in you. As someone once beautifully articulated it to me, food is energy, but food is mood, right? The difference it will make to your mental state when you're taking on food and keep your stress levels down. The other thing as well, which relates to the intensity of the training the harder you push, the more your digestive system is going to shut down as well. So don't think I feel great at the start of a race. Go out and hammer it because your body will not like you several hours later because your digestive system will start to do funky things like really weird stuff. Um, I've had races where after 10 kilometers, I didn't want to eat. My body didn't want to do things. My stomach hurt. And then at the 100 miler I did, I know I DNF'd it, but at the 50 mile mark, I had a McDonald's burger, fries and a milkshake and a coffee and was fine. You know, it's your digestive system does weird stuff. But with that, I paced myself, stuck to the strategy, ate frequently. My body wasn't stressed. Everything was hunky-dory and I felt great. So try different foods. On that note, figure out what, if there's aid stations at the event, figure out what's at the aid stations. If they use certain gels, if they use certain bars, who's sponsoring the event, go out and get some of those bars and test, 
test sachets and test them, right? High Five as a company, I'm sure makes an amazing electrolyte product, but that stuff goes through me like what, like, like it's just a pipe from my mouth to my butthole, right? I, I can't think of a better term than that. Sorry, that's gross. But basically, it just goes through me. Don't know what's in it. It must be a sweetener or something like that. There's nothing, not too, I've tried it different concentrations of carbohydrates, whatever it is. My body just doesn't like it. Weirdly, um, my body actually prefers to eat whole foods. So typically speaking, for me personally, I will snack on pretzels, sweets, maybe the odd sandwich, whatever. And then I will keep uh, my water is just water, not a sports drink, nothing like that, right? There's different mechanistic reasons for the reasons why that's not a disadvantage in this kind of event, but I'm not going to talk about that right now because it gets too, too, um, gets too long-winded. Basically, hydration is the other one. Keep sipping on your water, right? Keep drinking on it. Don't get distracted. Little sips of water every 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes, right? Don't worry about how much you're taking on board, but typically speaking, if you're not consuming at least 500 mils an hour on a reasonable day, up to like 750 mils, so half a litre to three quarters of a litre if it's a hot day, even maybe slightly more, then, you know, just be aware of your hydration. Don't get lost in chatting. Don't get lost in just, you know, whatever it is. Practice your hydration from early on. And then on top of that as well, hydration is one thing, but like just as a habit to get into from day one, whenever you're going out for a run, get yourself some effervescent or um, just electro just pure electrolytes and just put them in your water. You don't need them for shorter runs, but as a habit forming type thing, they're cheap as chips. You get a little tablet, kind of like, you know, like effervescent vitamin C you throw in, just put it in some water, every bottle of water you have, every 500 to 600 mil of water, have one of those electrolytes is the thing that will probably make more people fail that they don't legislate for than, than anything else, than their food. Because if your electrolytes get low and you keep drinking water, you get basically just your electrolytes in your body get more and more diluted, fatigue levels kick in. And obviously the act of being out in the countryside, whether it's a hot day or not, and working your muscles, you're going to deplete electrolytes quite quickly. So for me personally, electrolytes are the one thing which I am like super, 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 super anally retentive about when I'm racing. Even if I'm not like, even if I'm like, ah, I don't care what time it takes me. I don't need to worry about my food. If my food's not great, I'll just be a bit slower. Electrolytes are the one thing for me personally that is, is important for performance. And particularly if you're going to do something like a back-to-back -back event. So if you're going to do like a day one and a day two, get electrolytes in. Food you can eat on the next day. Like if your digestive system is not settling down, you can just take it a bit easier on day two and eat right of a morning and just graze food all day. Your electrolytes is going to help with digestion, help you give you rehydrated. Oh, and as a little helpful hint, um, check, start checking the color of your pee, particularly after if you're doing a, one day, a long day and a long run. Look at a urine color chart. If you just Google urine color chart, it will all become um, very clear as to... Um, uh, very clear as to as to what a, a healthy colored urine should be so uh, again race to the stones we had a lot of people finish day one and my first question to them is like keep drinking fluids keep flushing it through go and keep checking the color of your pee every time you go to the bathroom if you're not going to the toilet yet just keep drinking just keep sipping you don't want to glug in loads and loads and loads your body can only absorb so much water per hour but you do just want to keep sipping on water basically keep it flowing through you all day and it shouldn't be an issue and at the end of the day if you can, and oh, on a note as well, just if you glug a load of water and then you need to pee doesn't mean you're hydrated, right? Your body can only absorb so much water per per hour. So a lot of people, if they smash a load of water, they go, oh, my, my pee's coming through now, I'm hydrated, okay? Keep checking it for a few hours afterwards because uh, you might not be. Okay, so if you do all of those things, if you can commit to just being pragmatic in terms of your approach, not trying to run like a lunatic and blast out the miles, get in the right terrain, Look at your foot, get your foot situation on point, get your training structures around a little bit of strength work and just mainly focused on getting out and about time on your feet, maybe a couple of like structured running sessions just to talk about economy and efficiency, which we're going to talk about next. And then, and then just everything else has to be built around those longer runs and those days in the wilderness, really use those as an opportunity to experiment with different foods, different things, try different um, strategies. And again, you know, have a little jog down a hill, have a little jog when it feels nice, but just keep that effort level at like a five or six out of 10. Because over time, once you get up to four, five, six, seven hours, a five or six out of 10 in terms of pace or time will still feel like an eight or nine. So that's why I always call long, I call them, I always call them easy runs because they're an easy effort run, but you do an easy effort run long enough, they become hard, right? You know, 
you walk for 24 hours, that's an easy, it's easy to walk. But if you walk for 24 hours, you're going to feel pretty broken at the end of it. So again, I always call them long runs as well, but we're always trying to keep ourselves away from the edge of the cliff. If you follow those things and you sit, set your competition calendar out and say, I'm going to talk about this in a second and say, right, if I've got six months and I'm just going to build up, adding in half an hour on my feet, on my longer runs every single weekend for until I'm doing a distance of around about 70% of what I need to, whether it's split over two days, whether it's on one day, you'll be golden. You'll get it done, right? Simple as that. Easy, right? Now we get onto the complex stuff, right? Okay. So part two, I'll ask for questions at the end if anyone's got any. So part two is, I'm going to do a little zoom on this one. Um, how can I get faster? So this is, this is a big one, right? Now I'm going to have a little gripe and a moan here because this is something again that I see with, um, let me zoom in on this. I'm going to, I moan at a lot of people who do interval work because the pros do it. <laughs> now, interval sessions are great. I love them. A program for most of my athletes, even, even recreational athletes. I think they're important for a number of different reasons. So the interesting question is, is whenever I say like, why do you do interval sessions? A lot of people go, Oh, cause it, you know, it helps me get faster. I'm like, well, yeah, of course, you know, you're running faster. It's going to help you get faster. But the, the, the deeper question is why, why am I doing the type of interval session that I'm trying to do? Okay. So I would always encourage people to think about, think about what is it, fundamentally from a coaching perspective, whatever I'm trying to think about is what is the adaptation that I'm trying to get from my athlete? So by adaptation, am I trying to get them stronger? Am I trying to build their aerobic base? Am I trying to build their ability to tolerate forces am i trying to you know make them more stable am i trying to make them more mobile um whatever it is so here on the top we've got different types of intervals okay we've got long intervals short intervals repeated short sprints and repeated long sprints so these are all things that you might see programmed on any kind of running program you might download but they've all got very similar in some regards but very different um target adaptations so if we look at um Sorry, one second. If we look at the, sorry, if we look at the long, inter, uh, sorry, if we look at the intervals, the long and short intervals, if we look at the dash line across the middle there, that would be like our aerobic threshold. So that's the bit where we're running at a good high intense pace, but we could keep going for a good period of time, right? That's like our threshold. It's what's called a tempo run. You might have heard it called a tempo run, threshold run. So in and around that would be like our typical kind of like half marathon-ish, 10K half marathon-ish pace something we can maintain for about an hour with a good level of pace, hard effort, seven out of 10, eight out of 10 the whole time, right? So that's what that dashed line would represent. So interval sessions by definition or high intensity interval sessions are interval sessions that are operating for our duration above that, that level of intensity. So long intervals would be, would be a little bit above that intensity, but the duration is longer, right? Because the further we, we the further we look over that threshold wall, right? The long, the, 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 the less time that we can stay there, right? It's like, you know, we're trying to peek over the neighbor's fence and we don't want to get caught, right? The longer, the higher we go up, the more chance we're going to get caught, right? And we're going to have to just quit, right? So if we think of this axis here as being the intensity, how hard we're running, which would be our pace, our effort level, and the, the bottom along here is the duration. If we go over our threshold a little bit, then the longer the interval will be, right? Makes sense. Before we start to get fatigued and then our pace starts to come down and eventually we have to stop, Right. Why do we have to stop? Because we're accumulating metabolites in the body that our muscles don't like, our brain doesn't like, and says, whoa, horses, we can't keep doing this. We're giving our body a bit of a kick in. We need to slow down, get oxygen back in our body, and therefore, we're basically working anaerobically. The amount of time we spend in that anaerobic zone is going to be determined by the intensity. So why do we do this? Well, what's anaerobic training got to do with... Um, ultra marathon running right i've just said to you guys before most of the time is at five or six out of ten what's the what's the problem the reality is that that's actually right so i think there needs to be less of a focus on high intensity work for ultra endurance athletes it's my personal opinion but i do still use them and i'll explain to you why because the whole point of these long and short intervals in particular and to an extent the repeated short sprints is to spend time above that threshold because that causes adaptations in our ability to absorb oxygen, right? So that allows us to build a bigger engine, as it were. So it's like, if you want to force a muscle to grow, you have to create a stimulus, which is, uh, you have to put force through that muscle, which is more than it's accustomed to, right? So if we want to get stronger, we have to build weight week on week on week. 
So if we want to build our VO2 max and our maximal oxygen uptake, how much more oxygen our body can handle, right? Oxygen is important for producing energy. Then we need to make sure that we're spending some time stressing that system. And we can do that in two ways. One is low intensity, long duration. That's great. And the other is high intensity, short duration. And they both have slightly different effects on that aerobic system. They both work in slightly different ways. So that's why we train both components or we should train both components because they both cause adaptations, slightly different adaptations with the same fundamental outcome. So if we piece those two types of training together, we get success. So the point of longer intervals or short intervals is to maximize our time above this threshold, right? So one of the questions I get asked most often is like, well, how long should I do intervals for? How many intervals should I do? The reality is that it's, it's, it's another kind of how long is a piece of string question. But as a general rule, if you're at the point where the inter, you've done like, let's say you've done your fifth interval at a certain speed, right? And all of a sudden you can't maintain that speed and your speed starts to come down. What will happen then is your body's just starting to get more and more tired. At that point below a certain threshold, you're basically now doing an aerobic session. So the, the work becomes pointless. So if your heart rate, what you'll find is your heart rate will go high and it will maintain high. But as you get more fatigued, your intensity will get lower as you get tired. And eventually, when you start to get a big drop off in performance, that's usually a time to end the interval session. So let's say you've got you're doing your intervals at I don't know, you're running it. Um, you're running it on a treadmill because it's easier to talk about. You're running at 12 kilometers an hour on a treadmill. You do interval one for five minutes, interval two for five minutes, interval three for five minutes. Interval four, you're really struggling for dear life at the end. You start to drop off. Interval five, you can't run at the 12 kilometers an hour, right? Don't start decreasing the pace in order to maintain the amount of interval outputs. Just call it a day there as a general rule. Now, the reason that there's arguments around the different training modalities is down to this, is actually there's an individual variation with this. Some people will spend more time above threshold with longer intervals. Some will spend more time above their VO2 max threshold, their, sorry, their, their threshold with shorter intervals. And the only way we can possibly know this is by um, collecting data in a lab and looking at gas analysis. So most people don't have privy to those things. So what can we do? Well, the answer is it doesn't really matter. The fact of the matter is, as long as our training is progressive. So for example, and I'll talk about this in the programs in a second. If we say, right, my 5K time is X amount of time and my intervals are going to be 20% faster than that. I'm going to hold that until my pace starts to slow and then I'm going to recover for two minutes. Then I'm going to do another block. My pace starts to slow. Then I'm going to recover for two minutes. The good news is, is that if you actually look at this image here, with the long intervals and the short intervals, it doesn't really seem to matter about the duration of the interval within reason up until about, I think it's about eight to 10 minutes. The recovery time, because the intensity stays the same, right? Do you know what I mean? Like not the intensity between the short intervals have got higher intensity than the long intervals. But because the, um, what's my train of thought? But basically, because the, the intensity is at a certain level that you can only maintain those short intervals for a shorter duration, the longer intervals for longer duration, the recovery time is actually fairly similar, right? So two to three minutes rest between intervals seems to be, if you ask people when they feel fully recovered to go for the next interval, that will usually be two to three minutes for most people. Now, they'll feel recovered, but they still won't be able to perform at the same level after several intervals, right? Fatigue is going to kick in at some point. So whether you choose to use long intervals or short intervals, so short intervals, I would say, would be one minute to three minute intervals, three minute intervals longer, I would say, were long intervals. And again, what's going to determine whether you choose that is just preference. Try it. See if you get faster. See what feels good with you. And then, you know, I program both for my athletes. I might go through a block where we do short intervals. I might do a block where they do long intervals. I might do a block where they do repeated short intervals where they'll go work, rest, work, rest, work, rest, work, rest, very high intensity, very short rest periods. And then we do that for a block, a little bit of a rest. You've got these repeated sprint interval blocks and then you've got long sprints as well. So that would be like 30 seconds maximum effort for recovery, 30 seconds maximum effort. Why I would choose these things for an athlete from a coaching perspective depends on the athlete. If I've got an athlete that just does a lot of like slow and steady racing and I want them to get faster, you're going to have to get more cadence. You're going to have to turn your legs over. And that also comes with like things like if we're sprinting, for example, we're going to get increases in like tendon stiffness, elasticity in the muscles, this kind of plyometric sort of muscle elasticity effect. That's when we're going to want to do more of the report repeated short sprints and the repeated long sprints. And we want somebody to actually get used to their, their cadence and their turnover being much quicker. So one of the things that I would always say for running, typically speaking, a good cadence for running is about 180 strides a minute. 
if your running cadence is slower than that, you probably find that you probably want to start doing some sprint training, but like all, all training that is high impact and sprinting is high impact. So the further we go down this little image here, the easier we want to take it before we build up to our maximum intensity sprints. The other difference is the long intervals and the short intervals will usually be, be limited by some outcome. So you don't just start working maximally on your long intervals and let your performance de deteriorate over five minutes. You would set a pace or a time for that interval block. Same with the short interval. Repeated short sprints and repeated long sprints. The idea of the word sprint is you are working maximally for that entire duration, okay? So that's like you are just... And that, again, that sh shifts the energy system slightly. So the two most beneficial, I would say, for new runners are, uh, sorry, for, for runners in terms of their aerobic, aerobic system are the long intervals and short intervals. However, for a lot of runners who do a lot of mileage, but they're not very fast, I would actually say doing building in slowly into some sprint training is going to give a load of benefit. Now, the other one that isn't on here is, I'm going to shift over this way now. Do, 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 do. Can zoom out again now. The other one that's on here is is hill repeats, so hill training. Now, even roadrunners will lot, use a lot of hill hill running. A couple of reasons, several reasons. One, shifts the load of the focus of the muscles slightly. You're running uphill, you're running downhill. It's what we discussed before about that loading pattern. A lot of people will do hill repeats where they will like run up hills, right? I think it's worth doing some negative repeats as well, where you actually run down some hills just to get a feeling for it for that deceleration forces. Same principle as the other ones, though, the length of the interval, the duration of the interval, whether the sprints, you can take all of those systems on the left-hand side of the screen, all of these things over here, and apply it to hill repeats. You can do the duration, you can do long hill repeats, you can do short hill repeats. The other thing as well, which is, I think it's, it should be from what I was talking about, the gain and terrain aspect, before, you're using different muscle groups than you would be running on road running. So you should be doing, if, if you can, then doing some intervals on similar terrain or hill repeats would be like that as, would be good as well. The negative aspect of doing hill repeats, um, the negative aspect of doing hill repeats in terms of intervals is that they're less easy to monitor than a lot of these sessions because most of these sessions here are about adaptation to your physiology. They're not about adaptation to your terrain. Can you see the difference between those two things? The other one, the long, slow runs in the terrain and the up and down, yes, you're going to get some physiology adaptations to your terrain. This is more the pure aerobic benefit. So your things like your lactate buffering. And as well, you, there are going to be periods where you're going to want to push. When you're tired and you've got a big hill, you can't just decide to be in an RP5 or 6 if you're climbing up a mountain. There's going to be times when you're going to have to push. So we do need to work these energy systems as well. Sorry, that's the other bit that I missed off. That's the other reason why we train them. It might only be a short bit, but we've got to get comfortable being uncomfortable. And if there's one thing that's going to build your ability to tolerate being uncomfortable quickly, it's intervals. Yeah? Loads of people can get out there and walk for hours and shuffle, but if you want to build that mental resilience and fortitude, this is where the action is. It ain't fun having some targets to hit, having some paces to hit. Um, yeah, it's challenging, but it's worth it when you then know you can go into the hole and get back out of it again. Also helps that recovery of those systems as well. How much time should we spend on that type of training? Around 20% of our total training time within reason. Like I'm not suggesting if you're doing an hour's training a week, you've done 20 minutes being intervals, like 20 minutes being intervals. If you're doing only an hour's training a week, you're probably better off just doing like a full hour of, you know, moderate intensity steady state. But as we go, is that true? I don't know. I'm going to caveat that statement. I'm not sure I entirely believe that now I've said it. But anyway, but the point is like, if we're going to, as we increase our training hours, we don't want to be doing like two, three hours of intervals a week. A couple of sessions at 30 to 60, 20 to 40 minutes is normally where people bottom out. Obviously a quick warm up, five minutes, stride, mobility work, anything you need to do, you know, uh, the ramp thing, which is um, raise heart rate, activate, mobilize. Um, prepare mentally for the session. You still want to do warm-ups for all these. You don't want to just jump in. So RAMP's a good acronym. Acronym? Yeah. Abbreviation? Acronym? Whichever. Um, I always get those two wrong. So 20% of your training wants to be that. The rest of your training really wants to be mostly endurance-based. Now, where does tempo fit into this? Tempo sort of fits onto this end of the curve for me. So your tempo runs, like things that are this kind of dash line here, still fit in the sort of higher intensity bracket as well so kind of factor that in there even though technically physiologically it's in the mid zone a lot of your top athletes don't spend much time doing there there'll be loads of track repeats there'll be loads of track work but again we also need to be careful about how we translate this over to us as ultra athletes because it's not running on a road it's not running on a track so we always got to just be looking through this slightly sort of blurry eyed vision of what we're training looks like if we're trying to replicate what road marathon training looks like or you know um track track running looks like because 
it ain't going to look the same. But what we do know across a multitude of sports, professional cycling, other ultra sports, when we look at the top level athletes, um, there's always this gravitation towards this kind of 80-20 rule, which is 80% is done at like low intensity, lower effort, not low effort, but lower effort, low intensity, steady state kind of activity. And 20% is this higher intensity stuff. So, you know, there's proof in the pudding there, I think. Sorry, I'm just throwing water down myself there. Okay. So that's basics of training. Now, um, again, going back to part one, if you do want to do some runs, again, what I would say is don't just jump straight in with the intervals. If you've not done any running before, do a little bit of running first to get used to actually running at lower intensities because a lot of this is quite high impact, high fatigue, high risk of injury because there's high forces involved. Shockingly, you know, forces, mass times, acceleration. We're the same mass. If we're accelerating quicker, there's more force involved. Our joints like force. They don't mind force, but it has to be adapted to the load. Muscles, ligaments, tendons, so on and so forth. Whoop. Okay. So, um, the other thing as well then is about our competition calendar and how we plan for an event. As a general rule, if you want to reverse engineer this, um, if you know how much distance that you want to run on a race day, what you want to do on your, one of your training runs within the few weeks before that, at some point during your preparation phase, is you want to cover about 75% of that distance. So I would say if you're doing a 50K, you probably want to get out and do a run or a time covering the distance of around 35 to 40 K give or take shocking as it sounds. If you're doing hundred K, you're probably going to want to get out and do 75 K whether it's 35 K on two days back to back. Don't have to do it, but if you can build up to bear it, bear in mind, that sounds terrifying now, but if you started say six months out and you did 10 K one week, 14 K, 16 K, 18 K, 20 K before you know it, adding two K a week means that you're at those distances really comfortably. Right. So if we think backwards in terms of what we can add, so we're going to reverse engineer this. So if we know our distance, we want to cover roughly to get about two thirds to three quarters of the distance, the closer we can get to full distance in a sensible amount of increments, the better. The general guideline for running is this idea of like, don't increase your mileage by more than 10% each week. I've just discussed, or it should become clear now why this might not be the most sensible rule for ultra running, because we don't really we don't really know what mileage we're going to cover because of the, uh, the terrain and the elevation gain. So I always look at this idea of in terms of, right, how much time am I spending and multiply that by some kind of effort factor. So let's say I do an hour's run and I think it's a five out of 10. I will say that's 300 and I will add all of my sessions up for the course of a week. And then I will try and increase my total amount of load by about 10%, no more than 10%. And then whatever that load is, I can then divide that by as much as I want. So a bit, bit of quick maths. If I did an interval session at 20 minutes and it was a 10 out of 10 effort, so that's 200 interval minute efforts, okay? And then if I did my 60 minute, if I did a two hour run at a five, which is 120 minutes times five, which is 700 minutes, that means that my total load for that week is then, oh, 700 plus the first number what I've just given, which I don't know what it is. You guys have probably remembered that I don't. It's late on an evening, right? So we add those two together and then I add up all my sessions across the course of the week. And then I will try and only increase my total volume by about 10 to 15%. That's really complex. And I put some big exclamation marks on the bottom of that for the simple reason is there comes a point where it becomes impossible to do that. So what you will find is when you, when you backtrack and you say, right, I'm going to increase my 5Ks week on week on week for, or sorry, start at 10K and increase however many miles it is week on week on week or hours or distance it is week on week on week. What you will find is it becomes impossible from one week to the next to recover in that duration once you get beyond a certain distance, right? So if you're running really hard and you're pushing a half marathon or up to a marathon, uh, sorry, let's say a half marathon distance, and then the next week you might find that you're not recovered enough to go out and do the run effectively or at the paces or the times that you want. Now, you might still get out and do time on your feet, but ultimately you are going to get to a distance for a lot of people where we're going to have to kind of, it's going to look a bit like um, this kind of repeated sprint interval block or this short interval block here, where one weekend we're going to do a long run, we're going to reduce our mileage the next week or distance the next week or our load the next week, and then the week after we'll do the next long run. So we've got these week recovery weeks in between because there comes a point, like I've said, at which we're not going to recover on a week-to-week -week basis. Now, a little bit of running on tired legs the week after ain't going to be a problem. But let's say you've got a 28 kilometer week one weekend or a 28 eight kilometer long run one weekend and then a 32 kilometer long run the next weekend. The weekend after that ain't going to be a fun day at the office, right? Particularly if you're pushing your paces and your times. So 
the whole idea of a week to week increase in total training mileage volume, whatever it is that measure that you use for progression kind of goes out the window a little bit because you're going to have to have weeks where you're like down 80% in volume and then up a little bit more. But the point is with this, this is where the whole idea of understanding yourself as an individual athlete is. So you can have a training program and have a training template, but just because a template says do X or do Y doesn't mean that you, that's good for you. Recovery, sleep, um, stress levels, you know, loads of stuff is going to influence your ability to, to increase your volume by some arbitrary figure. Now, this guy, so we always, whenever I talk about these things, what I'm trying to get you to think about is not absolutes. I'm trying to get you to think about guidelines. Like I said before about this 20% rule, it might be that for a period of time, even if you're a fit athlete, for some reason, sprint, like hill repeats hurt your knees. So you can't do hill repeats, right? So we don't just follow them because I'm saying they're a good idea. Um, in fact, actually, to be honest, hill repeats is something that I generally only put in um, like if someone's not getting a lot of time on the trails. You know what I mean? If you're out doing your long runs or spending time on the terrain, then I'm taking care of that elevation, deceleration stuff. And again, we can have a little, we can put a, we can combine sessions as well. So we could do like our little walks for a couple of hours and then write, okay, I'm going to run the downhills at a high intensity and then recover. So you don't have to do these things separately as well if we are time pressed. But again, that's just where, that's where the difference between a downloadable programmable template and having a coach comes in to be able to sit and strategize. By the way, this isn't a USP for doing one-to-one -one coaching. Uh, sorry, a selling point for doing one-to-one -one coaching because I don't really do that anymore, for being honest. But it's more of a kind of indi indicator of what I'm trying to build in terms of membership sites because I'm sick of seeing people break themselves because of following programs that some running coach has written for an, a, a top-level athlete. Um, and then just there's no consideration that, you know, someone's got two kids, works 12 hours a day, and is expected to then, you know, run – a 10% increase in their mileage week on week on week for six months and then wonders why they end up overtrained, broke or both. So the other thing really then to how to get faster is this kind of ties into the first point is, uh, is your route planning, you know, get really good at your navigation, learn navigation skills, get good with a compass. Um, the better your navigation skills are, the less time you're going to stop and scratch your head and be confused. Do you want to get faster? This is where the kind of time cost benefit comes in, cost in terms of even potentially financial. It might be that you want to go out and actually go to the course, run the course. They'll have recce's for certain events. So the 100 miler I did, they've got training runs. My parents was right near to it. So I could basically go out on that course all the time. It makes a massive difference to understanding the terrain and your pacing. Not cheap, not easy. Um, I'm assuming most of the people who are watching this back might be running in their own country. Or if not, it's not a surprise why even top level athletes go and run a race in another country they might struggle because again, local knowledge and local terrain, where the aid stations are, how far it is, how changeable the weather is, things like how much elevation gain is going to be there. What's on the aid stations? What, what do I know to the nearest gram? How many carbohydrates am I taking on per hour? Um, how much, how many calories do I need to be taking on per hour? I put a little snail here. How do I adjust my pace dependent on the terrain and the conditions? So I don't start chasing my watch and end up hurting myself guilty right um how do i balance my strength training how can i fit more of those sessions in um you know there's another reason i put the weightlifting man there as well um oh the intensity of the lifting sessions that i'm doing the intensity of my weight sessions when do i put them in in my off-season calendar am i periodizing my training for one event or am i just trying to run loads of ultras something i've struggled with uh, a lot with with people who start ultra running is they get they will sign up for loads of events now, there's nothing wrong with doing some of your training runs on an event run, but it's still a training run, right? So you're not going out to set personal best. You're going out to take it easy to get miles in the legs. You can't be expected to run a hard as you can race, like an ultra distance 50K and above, maybe more than four, three or four times a year. You might be able to run that distance every single weekend, but I'm talking about if people are serious about setting PBs, Really pick your events, target your events, and use your, your other runs that you might sign up for as training runs. So, for example, I did the – for the 100-miler, I did the GB Ultra 50-miler, but the time of that in my program, I wasn't ready to run the full 80K in that. I was still recovering a little bit from injuries, so I just did 60K and dropped out, right? But it was on the same course. There was aid stations there, so I didn't have to worry about carrying my stuff. So people were like, oh, you DNF. And I was like, no, it didn't DNF. That was my intention. If I could have got to the finishing time or it felt good, 
then I'd have pushed it, but I didn't. And I was like, no, this is a training run. So I'm going to take a step away and do that. So you can use events as training runs, but they have to be training runs and not races. Very different shift in mentality and psyche. A lot of people get caught racing too often. So pick your event. If it's going to be 100K or 100 miler, depending on who's watching this, probably realistically, maybe one or two, one a year if you're a non-pro athlete, two a year if you happen to be an elite level pro athlete who happens to recover like a ninja and who's a genetic freak who's used to doing 100 mile training weeks, which basically takes the whole population down to like about this much of the population. So we just need to be aware of that again, trying to train like top level athletes. Um, again, in terms of route planning, you know that know the uh, elevation gain. Do you know how much you sweat in different environments in different conditions? Um, are you doing all your running in cold, nice air conditioned gym environments, but then you're going to go out and run on the trails? Is it, is it the UK where it's 40 degrees one day and then 17 degrees the next or it's snowing the next? Okay. So we need to understand if, if we're going to get faster and if we're going to push this to an extreme level of attention to detail, knowing things like your sweat rates in different temperatures and different environments, even an approximation is going to be useful. You can even do things like get electrolyte tests and see how much electrolyte you use losing sweat and stuff. Again, how reliable they are because your sweat glands actually hypertrophy and grow. So if you're not used to running in warm, warm environments and you've got a, a race in the summer in the UK, it might be worth doing some sessions in like a slightly warmer environment. So like, for example, in my clinic, I've got treadmills, I've got different kind of cooling fans and stuff as well. But if I started my running this year, I started doing it in um, mostly indoors. Like I did my outdoor runs outdoors, but I would like wrap up warm and keep myself super warm because again, you want to kind of get used to that level of discomfort because that will affect your pace. It will affect the distance that you need to consider between aid stations as well. So it might be that you can run all day long. If you, you're running on a treadmill and you've got a nice bottle of water and electrolytes with you, you can maintain a pace for hours and hours and hours. But if you can't carry that with you and there's a distance between aid stations, then there's the trade-off between, okay, well, what do I need to take with me versus the extra weight that I'm carrying, right? And if you look at a lot of the top ultra athletes now, they'll only really have like two water bottles in their hand and then they'll have people meet them along the way to keep them fed and fueled. In the UK, a lot of the bigger races are going to demand that you have a certain amount of essential kit. So please, t oh, that was meant to be part one. Check for your essential kit, because if they do check it and you're not got the right kit, then it can be a bit of an issue. They very rarely check, but we don't want to take that risk. And the essential kit's there for good reason, okay? Um, and the other thing as well is, and this ties in a little bit to part one, but understanding in a bit more detail, like exactly how much food and fluid you can take on per hour exactly what kinds of foods that sit well with you and again that might then be um whether you need to have your own specific aid crews or pit crews with you if you are trying to run super fast because let's say the aid stations that are there don't have foods that you can tolerate okay um particularly if let's say someone's got a very specific uh, allergy you know uh, like celiac or uh, you know anything irritable bowel syndrome anything like that which is going to put extra stress in the digestive system you've got to have make sure you've got safe foods there if you want to get faster OK, because those are the things that are going to cause people to to uh, to really, really struggle to maintain their output and their performance. And that's when they're going to get frustrated. And then there's the unknowns, you know, like our diet beforehand, eating lots of fruits and vegetables, making sure we're eating our calorie needs in our training runs so that, you know, we don't just use this as an opportunity to like burn loads of calories. We, if we're going to use it as a weight loss aid, that's fine. But we just want to make sure that we're not losing weight too quickly or our output's too high because we don't want to make get do all of this training get to a week or two weeks out from the event and end up getting a horrible illness, bug, flu, cold or whatever, because, you know, we've been under eating and we've not been paying attention to our nutrient quality. Okay. So that's it really. That's the session finished. I just wanted to go through some things really quickly to highlight some of the points. So um, these are screen captures from um, a program that I've written. So this is part of my membership site. So basically what I've done is I talked about this idea of incrementing programs. So this is just I'll talk you through it really quickly so it makes sense. So I've written a program which has got, ah, wrong one. Sorry, I'm zooming in. I'm on the wrong slidey thing. It's this one here I want. Sorry. Okay, I'm just going to do, deal with this. Uh, oh, it's the plus and minus. So at the bottom of the, uh, basically each program has got different days a week of running, depending on how much time commitment people have got. So I've written a program for different days of running, three days a week, four days a week, five days a week. It's called a performance program, but realistically for three runs a week, that would be someone who's like, does a bit of running, hasn't got much time to train, but wants to win an ultra, but without killing themselves. And on this, basically, it's got that some of the concepts I was talking about before. So this is a 10-week program. This is designed for be built up to 50K. 
Uh, obviously, if you were going to do to 75K, double the distance back to back 50K, 50K, and you wanted to get faster, didn't just want to complete it uh, and suffer through it, then you know, you'd probably want to increase the duration of, like maybe run two of these cycles back to back or do a, do a slightly different program that I've got for longer distances. But this shows the di- what I was talking about before in terms of like, you might start week one, you know, you've done your base program. Don't worry if you can't run 20K just yet. I'll talk about that in a second. But you might do your easy run. Again, this is going to be on specific terrain. You'll do 20, 20K, 22K, 24K. Then at that point, we're going to be fatigued. So we take a bit of a deload week, right? So we take a low week here. Then we go 28K, 31K. Now our volume is building up quickly again, but then we're going to back off again and take an easy week. Then we're going to do one, one hard week, easy week, one hard week, and then our events there. Now, these might shift and these might move. So I know what you're thinking, Paul, why would you write a program that is going to shift and move? Well, the point is that these are good templates to give people a starting point. But through the membership area, what I then do is I can, you can, people can share their data with me. And in our live sessions, I can go through and then we can make adjustments on the fly to whatever it is. Or people can just use these templates as runs here. And so for this one, I've got two easy runs and then we've got an interval run. Interval runs, I tend to program to be done on a treadmill. So I've got treadmill speed here or off pace if you want to do it outside, minutes per kilometer, minutes per aisle. And the cool thing is that all of these sheets will then adjust the pacing dependent on how hard you found the session. So the, the sit, you know, I was saying before about the duration of the intervals and how hard they are and like how you find those things. <clears throat> you basically put an effort score in here for each session and then that will increase or decrease depending on how hard you find the sessions, okay? Um, Again, I'm not going to go too much into that here because that's all on the, on the site. And then obviously there's a tempo run there as well. So that's the four runs a week one, a tempo run, an interval run, and then two easy runs, right? This sheet has actually got numbers missing out of it. I must have screenshotted the wrong sheet because this has got runs in here as well. So this would be a good one for like a back-to-back 50 because there would be you'd be doing two long runs on two days a week, right? You don't have to do back-to-back long runs, but... Um, that's the way it is. And then the three day, three runs a week is two long runs and one interval session. No, it's a long run, a tempo run, an interval session. And the five runs a week is two long runs, two interval runs, and a tempo session, which would be basically, I'm looking at people there who are like pretty serious runners. So there's different runs for different people on there. If you can't run up to 20K yet, one of the things I've got on there as well is this base running program. So basically, you can set the distance which you feel comfortable running at at the moment. And then from that, it will calculate all of those same numbers. But basically, it will build you up to anything up to half marathon distance. So this would be something I would run for maybe 10, 12 weeks before taking on an ultra program. If you've never done any running before, it will get you there. So realistically, to go from doing zero running or a little bit of running, you know, like let's say you've done a couch to 5K is where I'd say a start point was from this. Okay, If you haven't done a couch to 5K, do a couch to 5K. Once you can run 5K, this is where this program would start. But assuming you can run a 5K, you do the odd park run. Basically, you'd be looking at, I would say, around about 10 to 20 weeks to get up to being a decent ultra runner, like get, having a decent fun day out at an ultra run, or at least be able to push yourself. Same again, easy run, interval run, and a tempo run. Just the numbers are slightly different on that because obviously the level is slightly different as well to do with the distances as well. Okay. And then the final one I've got on here as well is this is for some people who've asked me. So this is, oh, it's really, 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 really big program. So this is a similar program, but this has got a strength block built into it. So this would be like a hybrid program that I follow in my off season. This isn't specifically for ultra marathons just yet. It's just them. Sorry, let me scroll over. So it's got all the workouts there on my website as well. I also have strength workouts that you can kind of similar sort of thing. It tells you the reps, the sets, you put numbers in and it will change your numbers up and down for you. And what I would always advise to runners is that if, if you want to get decent and you've got access to a gym and you want to do good strength training, the strength programs would be like add one of those strength programs in a week. So you might do the three runs plus a strength program. And again, this is just an example of how like a strength program might look. You've got all these movements here. So this has got like a, an upper body, uh, a full, um, what's it? Like they're all, they're sort of, oh, these are two full body sessions that you do. So you do like a pushing movement, a pulling movement. Uh, a, a, like a leg exercise for your quads, your hamstrings. You do that a couple of times a week. And then all the running session is here, runnings are here as well. So this is two interval sessions. And then um, this is a, this is your easy run. Now this is designed, this isn't designed for ultra marathons, this one. This is a base program that I would run for someone who's really interested in getting like big and strong and running as well, okay? Your running is going to take a bit of a kick in because you're going to be more focused on strength. If you wanted more of the pure running programs, so like if you see here, oh, let me zoom out. On the pure running programs for a reason, and this is just highlighting, not that I'm trying to sell you into this at all, 
But this highlights the fact that if you look, it says like two runs a week plus a strength session, three runs a week plus a strength session, four runs a week plus a strength session. So whenever I say if someone's going to train five sessions a week, one of those should be a strength session. You can tag on interval sessions at the end of a strength session if you want to make it convenient. That's the reason why I showed you this. So you can just tag an interval session on at the end of a strength session. Even if you're just doing, you don't have a really structured strength workout like this with progressive loads, you can still just do a strength session and then maybe do your, you know, an interval session at the end of it. As long as you're not tiring your legs too much, obviously, because you still want those sessions to be productive. So um, that's it for today, guys. Finally, I'm going to give you one more number. So on my membership site, because there's always got to be a sales pitch at one of these things, right? It's like a, uh, what's it like a timeshare? Basically, if any of this is interest you, I've got, I'm putting a code on just for this week for anyone who's attended this or watches it on catch up. And it's ultra 25 on the membership site, which is just where you registered for the thingy book, just plus sign up. Okay. So it's 25% off. Now with this, the, the bonus of this is you can log in, register for a month, which is 34.99 with 25% off. You can download all of the programs. You can get access to my nutrition app, which is on there, my nutrition guides, everything. You can turn up for a full month. You can cancel any time, turn up for a full month, do a live Q&As with me for a full month. I can help individualize your program. You can cancel your membership. And basically you've got loads of cool stuff for 35, well, for 26 pound, right? You've got a program, you've got it individualized, you've got a nutrition app and you've got me. And I also do two live coaching sessions on a, on a well, back-to-back -back coaching sessions, which is a bit of the core mobility, injury prevention, -y, injury risk reduction type stuff on a Wednesday evening as well, which is just before, for the turtles here this is just before the turtle live i might move it to a different day so i've got a bit longer um or you can sign up for three months and that's 100 quid but with 25 percent off but again you can cancel any time and then that basically on the back end of the site and i wish i'd showed you this now on the back end of the site there's programs for running cycling triathlon um combat sports ultra running half marathon marathon pure strength training all of this stuff is fully automated that I've written. That's what I've been doing for the last six months while I've had my head down, right? So it's it's very it's it's very structured towards not necessarily like people who want to be like top level competitive athletes, but people who just want to get a little bit of structure, okay? And there's different programs that run from base programs, which is basically like get you up, get you moving, get you getting some times, and then you've got performance programs, which is kind of like the 50k one I've just showed you there, which is like let's just get it's, it's either a hard event to do or you want to run it fast and then there's elite programs which are then things i haven't built yet which is basically like this is how the pros train but it's all guided as like a gradual progression as well so yeah just check it out see what programs are on there it's all on the website um and yeah basically what it will allow us to do is have these templates see how it goes and then we can make adjustments on the fly we have nutrition chats training chats and everything that you've got, like I say there that I've showed you these templates plus a million others is completely downloadable. So once you've got them, you can just bugger off and you can use them and they're there yours forever because it's just a copied Google sheet. Eventually we'll be getting this built into an app, but right now I quite haven't got the time, money or inclination to do that. Okay. Right. Before we bail, I'm going to stop the share. Has anyone got any questions before we go quick five minutes, feel free to unmute yourselves and shout up if anyone's got anything, or is that a fairly comprehensive hour and a half worth of a blast through trail right a lot of that might just be, i've seen people taking notes furiously this is going to be posted not onto youtube immediately because i know people have like signed up and stuff so i'm going to post this into a google drive and give people a link if they want to watch it back slowly and carefully okay then they can do that so don't feel like this is a one-stop deal i've just panicked and just checked it was recording and it is recording there as well um if anyone wants to have a chat and go through the membership site um, and just to see if there's anything on there or any questions on it, please let me know and I can just book you in with a quick 10 minute call just to go through and show you the programs. Literally everything in terms of how to, if there's a lot of numbers on the spreadsheet that sound confusing or not clear, literally I've done video guys for everything of how to use them, how to adjust them, what to do if you're sick, what to do if it's too easy, what to do if it's too hard. Yeah, I've thought of everything that I can possibly do to put my brain into a membership site, um, apart from you know the terrible, terrible metaphors and analogies that I use. Right, so has anyone got any questions before we before I Christian Bale? I like to put actors' names into to statements. No, we good? Awesome. Right. But if anything does pop into your beautiful brains, um, you've got my email address now. Just shoot me an email, okay? Right. Have a great rest of your evening. Well done, Lionesses. Well done, Liverpool, yesterday in the Charity Shield. See you all later. Please sign up even if you hate Liverpool. Bye, bye, bye.